Coming up on Over a Barrel. Does Baltimore receive any of their fuel through their port or is it all basically a pipeline situation? Are we looking at any issues? There are several terminals, several bulk terminals with those massive white uh, above ground mm-hmm. storage tanks that supply Baltimore. Over a Barrel starts right now. Welcome to Over a Barrel. I'm Matt McLean alongside Patrick DeHaan. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode. Make sure that you subscribe to our uh, podcast, uh, whichever particular platform you happen to use to stream it on. And of course, you can always find us over on Twitter as well as on Facebook. And you can even email us questions that we would love to answer for you as well. Patrick, what are the, uh, well, Twitter slash X, I guess we're calling it, Facebook and some other things. Give us all that information if you would. Yeah, Matt. Good to be with you again. If anyone wants to reach out, feel free to shoot an email to us. Podcast at gaspody.com is the best way to get a hold of us. Or as Matt mentioned, you can reach us on social media. We're at Over a Barrel Show on X, also on Facebook under the same address. Uh, and you can check us out, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, just about anywhere. Throw us a rating uh, and make sure to subscribe. We're also on YouTube at the Gas Buddy channel on YouTube. You can catch the uh, video version of the podcast there as well. So, uh, hey, great to be with you, Matt. Another week. And I don't know where you are today, but certainly a lot going on at the pump and around the world. Yeah, you actually, uh, I'm actually in Kentucky today. Tomorrow I will be in Tennessee, as at least of the time of this recording. And then uh, some other day later this week, I think I'll be in Indiana, Illinois, or Missouri. I'm not really sure. I'll have to go look at the schedule while, while, while you're talking. But uh, yes, a lot going on. And I am spending a lot more money in gasoline right now than I have been over the past winter. Uh, what's going on at the pump? Why are prices continuing to rise? Well, you know, uh, kind of the same reasons, a bit of a broken record, but we've seen, as a, to your point, uh, seen some big increases here in the last week, uh, real hefty jumps in some areas. The national average about on par with what it was a week ago at about 354 a gallon, but there's been a lot of changing dynamics. Uh, average prices in Utah, Matt, are up 24 cents a gallon, Alaska up 14 cents, Idaho up 14 cents. Nevada up 12 cents, Washington state up 10 cents. So the the West Coast is getting slammed. And a lot of that uh, is because not only the transition to more expensive blends of gasoline, but keep in mind, Washington now has a low carbon fuel standard, which basically costs you money. You have to basically uh, buy uh, fuel. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the right to use that gasoline. Like a carbon tax credit or something? Carbon offset, that's carbon right. Offset. Uh, cap and trade is what <clears throat> California has, is Washington State doing a low carbon fuel standard, which basically makes refineries buy permits or credits to be able to produce fuels. So that's hitting the West Coast, but the switch over to summer gasoline is impacting the West Coast as well. So um, yeah, a lot cooking for those West Coast areas, but not everybody has seen increases. In fact, as we as we stand here today, Michigan's actually seen a bit of a decrease here in the last week. Florida, where I'm at, Matt, I just filled up uh, Monday at 3.45 a gallon, and Tampa, of course, I was kicking myself because the next day it did go down to 3.35 instead of 3.41. But now today, Florida is seeing a jump back up to 3.59. That's where prices went about a week and a half ago. So that's a routine price cycle. If you're in the Great Lakes, if you're in Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, you've seen prices drop over the last week, but we could see a, what we call a price cycle in some of those areas of the Great Lakes uh, later this week. So stay tuned for that. But the rest of us, well, man, it's 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 been, you know, it, it could be worse. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. down in Kentucky where you are, prices are up another six cents. The statewide average in Kentucky now 327. So I hope you uh, pinched a couple more pennies uh, so that you could fill your tank up. The national average now is 25 cents higher than it was a month ago. And, and, you know, Matt, talk about inflation, but the national average is back up 13 cents compared to a year ago. So, Well, there are <clears throat> stations all around me right now that are charging 339 340 a gallon. So basically, I'm about 20 cents lower than uh, per se in Tampa, where you are currently at. I was in Tennessee last week, and it was close to about the same price as that. I was also in Illinois 48 hours ago, and prices were substantially higher than that. <laughs> um, surprise, and, surprise. Right? And Missouri was averaging close to that to that 329, 339 
uh, mark as well. So at least as a good sampling here across the upper South Midwest, um, prices are, you know, not, nothing shocking. And by that, I just simply mean Illinois is being Illinois and the other states are being their states. So um, the price points are what they are. And there have been some times over the past uh, year or two where I've actually seen prices per se in Missouri and Kentucky almost be equal to that of Illinois for short periods of time. Not sure what caused that because, you know, normally that's not the case, but Nevertheless, that's, a, that's a, that dream you had the other day when prices in Illinois are finally Sam. I, I think that's what you were <laughs> referring you mean to. Nightmare dream. Is that what we're talking about? I see well, I, yeah, I guess it's depending on the price, Matt. If it's not a dollar ninety nine, I guess it's a nightmare to you, right? It's pretty close to that. I mean, if or you, was it ninety nine cents? I, I can't yeah. remember. But to your point there, looking at the two states, Kentucky's average today three twenty seven a gallon and uh, Illinois <laughs> three eighty nine. So. Talk yeah. about, and by the way, looking at my map here, that's probably one of the biggest differences. Although New Jersey and Pennsylvania today, New Jersey 329, Pennsylvania 365. So, you know, if we're looking for big differences between border states, I think I think Illinois and Kentucky is probably the biggest difference there. Again, 389, Illinois, 327 in Kentucky. Wow. Yay. Yeah. And I have Polish hug, some... get that gas buddy app out, right? And, <sighs> yeah, and fire I've been it up using and... it and, and the gas buddy card as well. I've been using it religiously. So the prices that I am giving are not the discounted, thankfully, the discounted prices that I'm usually able to get with the gas buddy card, which we haven't talked about in a good while. I'm a consumer aspect on the gas buddy card. You can maybe explain a little bit more about what the card does if you would uh, do that very quickly. Well, you know, and I, I used it, you know, we didn't, I didn't really say what I, you know, paid uh, when I filled my tank the other day, but I certainly did use my pay with <laughs> gas buddy card. I always do um, as I pull up my receipt because the, the retail sign said, as I, I said, 341. Mm -hmm. um, but as I quickly try and look at my receipt here, because uh, by the way, if you do have the pay with gas buddy card, you get uh, your receipt emailed to you. Yes, you do. Because the difference is that um, you know you won't see the necessarily the lower uh, price show up at the pump, but we uh, take less money out of your checking account. Essentially, the Gas Buddy program does not take as much money out. Do you so, know how much more convenient that is for somebody like a, a business owner like myself that does like you know video production? And you have to save all those receipts. Do you know how much more convenient that is? Email so that receipts the, that it, the receipts is, are emailed, and it's so much easier because half the time yeah, the I gas mean, pump is 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 you know out of paper. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, yeah. it's and so the receipt. Well, it's, it's like, a nice well, backup mechanism, right? Exactly. You know, it's like, okay, so, go inside and get the receipt because the local pump doesn't ugh. have paper in it or whatever. And you how many times that. does that happen, right? You pull up to a pump and it's like, doggone it. So, you know, a after my, um, I got a little bit of a loyalty discount. Uh, so technically I paid 336.9, but after the gas buddy discount, uh, let me quickly do the arithmetic here uh, after the gas buddy discount. I spent uh, three ten again, oh. three ten, and actually, it, just the way I, I, I didn't quite round up, so it's actually three oh nine nine. So instead of paying three thirty six nine, Matt, I paid three oh nine nine. And by the way, I, I do have the premium Gas Buddy card, the premium Pay with Gas Buddy card. Um, by the way, it does link to your checking account if you want to check out the program for yourself, uh, go to gasbuddy.com and look for the pay with gas buddy card. I also get free uh, roadside assistance. So Matt, if you ever decide to slash my tires one night, hopefully that never happens. But <laughs> if you, if you get angry for gas prices being above that 99 cent a gallon mark, um, you know, at least, at least they'll be able to tow me to the dealership or somewhere else where yeah, dealerships probably real expensive. I would probably never want to go there, but, uh, I can get towed to get new tires if you decide to angrily, you know, think that I'm the root of, of gas prices. I would never slash your tires. I, I, I would never do that. I, I can't imagine. Uh, the only thing paper. I would slash, Matt, for you is slash your <laughs> gas prices. And that's you already have the pay with gas buddy card. So ma that's mission true. accomplished. I mean, maybe TP the trees in your yard, perhaps, I suppose. But to toilet paper's gotten very expensive, too. So a lot of people cut back on that. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I'm not advocating right. would, it for it, by the way. I, I would be the one that... Uh, <laughs> I would be the one that uh, literally would be uh, uh, taking the teepee out of the trees and probably using it. As long as it doesn't rain. <laughs> I'll leave. I'll leave the the the, the cardboard. Yeah, man, buy a good brand. <laughs> buy a good brand. Buy like a four ply instead of a one ply. No deal. All right, we got that. All right. Well, listen. 
Uh, now that we've got some of those prices out of the way, um, I've got some questions for you. Uh, as of the time of the recording for this, we have seen a, a huge incident take place in Baltimore, um, and it is creating some problem. And, and by that, I'm just simply talking about the bridge collapse. I've actually driven over that bridge uh, several years ago uh, there at the port of Baltimore or at the mouth of the the port of the Bal- of Baltimore. And so I have some questions for you with regard to that because I'm even seeing stories now about how logistics companies are scrambling. Obviously, the channel is closed and will be for some time. But not only that, the bridge uh, is now gone as well. And our thoughts and our prayers are certainly with, with everyone involved in all of that in, in, in all sincerity. But I want to yeah. ask you about the idea, does Baltimore receive any of their fuel uh, through their port, or is it all basically a pipeline situation? Are we looking at any issues in the greater Baltimore area as a result of this when it comes to fuel? Yeah, that's been a commonly asked question here this morning, Matt, um, and and obviously thoughts with the construction workers and the drivers. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking. Rescues out there right now. It absolutely is. I mean, you, you've seen the, 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 the video footage of that. It's just, it defies, you know, any sense of, of what can happen to a bridge. And it's just, you know, I'm just thinking like, Hey, you know, bridges, are they, are they safe if they're not protected? But, uh, to your point, um, you know, since I am a petroleum analyst focusing on, on, you know, what we know about this, um, to your point, there are several terminals, several bulk terminals with those massive white, uh, above Mm -hmm. ground storage tanks that supply Baltimore and the Eastern seaboard, Now, Baltimore is not so critical in that regard. There are three terminals that supply the area. Those terminals are, they do have the ability to receive product um, via barges that generally would be coming from, well, places like New York, um, outside of that region as well. But they, they, it's, it's not a highly traveled area when it comes to petroleum imports. uh, Or arrivals. Um, Most of those ports are also hooked up to the, Colonial Pipeline, uh, which dead ends into Linden, New Jersey. But these these three terminals, I believe all of them have a connection to the Colonial Pipeline. So the the flow of product coming from barges um, has been halted, as you mentioned, obviously now for an investigation, the bridges in the water. Um, the port is, is, is closed indefinitely, though, you know, let's touch on that here in a couple of minutes. Uh, but for now, um, these ports may remain open with lim- limited flows of, of product. I think, you know, the Colonial Pipeline is now uh, line three and four, which which go into this area are probably going to be heavily relied on. And there is only a finite amount of space. So what can happen in these types of instances is Colonial Pipeline will may say to its normal customers, hey, normal customers can, can you know, uh, use the pipeline as they normally would, but it may limit other customers to allocation, meaning that they they are allocating their pipeline so that you know it's not just one person getting access. They may allow smaller batches to be run through the pipeline. Um, one of the interesting developments is ethanol, which is blended into gasoline and needed to be blended in to basically get the octane rating, right? You can't sell regular that says 87 on the pump, but the only way the 87 is 87 is if you put um, ethanol in that gasoline, bringing it up from 85.5 to the 87 sticker. So the, the interesting challenge here, Matt, is ethanol is not shipped via pipeline uh, due to its caustic nature. It's generally shipped via rail car or um, barge in this case. So there may be a little bit more susceptibility uh, to add ethanol into gasoline. But I still think, um, uh, according to some of the sources on Twitter who know a little bit more about the flow of gasoline, um, my source uh, that mentioned something on this, uh, Jordan Fife, who's an energy ag trader, uh, by the way, he's on X at Jordan Fife one mentioned that, uh, that the flow of ethanol would probably not be massively uh, configured differently. He, he mentions in a, a, a tweet that there's a rail, a direct rail capacity into Baltimore that you can truck from uh, Virginia, Philadelphia, and New York Harbor. Uh, also mentioning that uh, there's an ethanol plant in Pennsylvania about 200 miles away. So Jordan believes that it won't be a big deal. Um, you know, and in, what are your in, thoughts in, on that? Yeah, you know, and again, coming back to the timing, it's all going to be about the timing. 
Um, I've seen some estimations, you know, uh, obviously the port's indefinitely closed. And I think it's a little bit insensitive to, you know, try to focus on when it can be reopened, right? Obviously, there there's a loss of life here. Um, yeah. And I'm That's not going to concentrate on... Absolutely. Uh, and I'm not going to concentrate on, on trying to have a definitive date. But it is important to, you know, in my role to make some assumptions on when when things, you know, there will be investigations. There's obviously loss of life here. And there's, uh, I think NTSB is on the ground. They're sending a go team. Uh, the FBI is on the scene. The Coast Guard's on the scene. Um, there have been various states of emergency declared. So th- there are a lot of assets pouring into this, both mm-hmm. for investigations and both for mitigation work down the road. Now, obviously, it's very early, right? I'm not going to focus on, you know, when it's going to be reopened. But I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of interest, Matt. Uh, We've already seen politicians. President Biden has been briefed on this. Mm -hmm. Um, Sources are saying that he's going to make comments here later today. He he did make some comments just a little while ago, actually, while you were uh, uh, detained uh, doing some additional interviews prior to the recording of this uh, podcast. He made the statement that the federal government will be picking up the tab for rebuilding the bridge. He also plans to visit uh, that area uh, as soon as it is uh, technologic or, you know, logistically possible because anytime any president makes a visit to any uh, part of the country, it, it, it obviously taps resources for security and other aspects. So he is being uh, mindful of that. Um, He uh, reiterated that he does believe and that all the government agencies indicate At this time, it looks like a terrible and unfortunate accident, nothing intentional, uh, and even made the comment about how the ship issued a mayday uh, before the crash, saying that they had lost power, um, and that allowed uh, emergency personnel to uh, basically halt the flow of traffic in both directions. Otherwise, the loss of life, uh, unfortunately, could have been uh, far greater than than what it is already feared to be. So he has made those comments and saying that every single resource of the federal government uh, will be uh, available, obviously, to the Baltimore area and the state of Maryland. And understandably, um, you know, it, it's 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 going to be yeah. a while. So the, the, there's, I mean, bottom line is this: there are a lot of assets, both from local, state, and federal authorities. Um, this port is not significant necessarily for petroleum. But it is a large port that handles 100,000 vehicles coming into the United States every year. So major auto manufacturers are reliant on this port. You know, there's other industries here, too, Matt, that, you know, um, are affected by the shutdown. Um, You know, products like latex shipments, um, uh, wood pulp as well. There's a lot of different things that the port is used for. And by the way, it's not just, I mean, there's multiple parts of this port map. There are different terminals here that make up the Baltimore port. Um, And not all of of them are blocked. There are two uh, Marine terminals that are outside of 695 of this bridge. Um, But there are the North Locust Point and the South Locust Point, as well as the Fairfield Marine automobile terminal that are all going to be affected. Um, and so the facility, not just not just handling autos and, and, and things like petroleum, but wood pulp, lumber, latex, steel, paper, um, a lot of products move here. And so the bottom line with all these assets pouring in, there will probably be a lot of, of, of manpower on scene to be able to investigate this very quickly or as expeditiously silly as and carefully as possible. And keep in mind with side sonar and Matt, you're very familiar with drone technology. The FAA yes, blocked this area. So uh, I think, you know, authorities are probably going to document the scene very carefully, but that will also allow them to move into a recovery stage uh, a bit faster. So, you know, when it comes to estimations, given this port, how large it is, keep in mind that the the Port of Baltimore was also uh, made an appearance in the 2002 movie, Some of All Fears. This port moves a lot of material. And so ultimately, I think that there's going to be a, a lot of manpower that will help get the Port of Baltimore reopened a little bit quicker and, and maybe a couple of weeks. And that that comes into my calculus then on being impacts to petroleum, to ethanol, is that this is going to be a headache significantly, uh, you know, in the next couple of days as products suddenly have to move via different routes, right, to get to where they need to go. 
So you um, think uh, for fuel wise, though, you think that the pipeline, it, it hasn't been. And I just kind of want to recap just a little bit of that for those, uh, you know, you're not thinking that the port itself is going to be a huge situation for any type of gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, any kind of a major hiccup uh, for, for fuel supply at this point. Uh, not at this point. <clears throat> That's where, again, uh, the, the Colonial Pipeline comes into play because the, the aforementioned uh, terminals and facilities that are now blocked from being accessed via the port still can be accessed via pipeline. So it, 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 gasoline is going to continue flowing without a doubt. Um, you know, it, it's just a question of, of how it's going to get there in some instances. Keep, keep in mind, because the storage capacity at the, the port, these three different terminals, probably have a storage capacity uh, in excess of a million barrels, which is over 42 million gallons. So I'm not concerned about that. It's just how are things going to be routed around this? Um, Colonial Pipeline is going to be heavy, heavily relied on. And again, that's where the the, the estimate of, of restoration comes into play. You know, will will there be issues? But I think the, the, the port, you know, potentially could reopen in weeks, not months. So... Uh, timing, I'm I'm not really concerned, uh, you know, from that standpoint. But again, th- this highlights, you know, not just the bridge, but this infrastructure itself highlights the importance of infrastructure. It's there when you need it, and when something happens, you know, it, it's absolutely critical. Yeah, and that's certainly understandable. And I wasn't actually going to mention what's called a, a notice to airmen, a NOTAM or a TFR, which is a temporary flight restriction. But yeah, they have. Uh, obviously, the FAA has issued that, uh, and it is going to be in effect for a while, uh, and not just impacting drones, but really even aircraft itself. So, like med- media helicopters and other aspects uh, can't uh, get below 1,500 feet uh, above uh, the ground level there or the water level there. Uh, and so, that's if you happen to be watching some of the coverage. Uh, you may see uh, helicopters way off in the distance with some of their media cameras and stuff. Uh, that's why they can't get any closer. There is just a, a flight restriction where they're not allowed to do that. So um, that's something to kind of keep in mind as well. But we will certainly here uh, keep you uh, posted on that. And should anything uh, change, we'll, of course, even uh, if we need to even do a special edition of Over a Barrel to kind of keep people informed of what's going on in the Baltimore and the the Northeast and the East Coast, we are more than uh, happy Absolutely. to play our role as best as we can and all of that and keep you informed as just as really as best as we can in all of that, those areas. And again, our thoughts and our prayers certainly go out uh, to everyone involved uh, with the incident that has taken place. And, and it is going to be, I mean, no matter how many resources you throw at it, there's still a nearly 2000 foot section of, of steel concrete and infrastructure that is now sitting uh, in the water that is going to have to be removed before they can safely open that channel. This is not going to be a quick solution at all it's going to take a while and, and by a while i'm i mean we're, we're probably talking minimum weeks uh it, it's not going to be anything that they can quickly get out uh, of the way so uh, we'll, we'll monitor that now let me ask you about something else transitioning here just a little bit um actually uh just not even hours before uh, this horrible incident took place there was a little bit of good news or um, almost surprising news with regard to oil and gasoline. Um, and th- that's some news uh, news articles out there that are being touted as the USA is now producing more oil and gas than any nation ever has on the history of the planet. And even as far back as September of last year is setting all time highs uh, for barrels per day and all of these other aspects. So Let's dive into that for just a moment, and and I want to kind of pick your brain on some of these things. Um, you have obviously been aware of this. You're probably rolling your eyes going, duh, this isn't new. But sometimes news headlines uh, create a little bit of a noise that we want to address. But so um, are we still kind of at those levels, or are we even higher than uh, September of last year when it comes to the to the BPD, the barrels per day? Yeah, you know, we, we've seen uh, we've seen kind of a, a, a maximized rate here of just over 13 million barrels a day. We've actually seen a little bit of a decline here in the last uh, couple of weeks. The rig count, which uh, is a leading indicator of where oil production will be down the road, the rig count has continued to, to, to decline gently. Um, that's probably because uh, oil prices aren't as lucrative or haven't been in recent months. 
this is not so uh, you know so much of a weekly fluctuation. Um, uh, these these decisions are probably a little bit further out than that, but it is kind of an indicator. Uh, for now, rig counts have been a little bit lower, although last week I think it did perk up slightly. Uh, but U.S. oil production, which had reached 13.3 million barrels a day, according to weekly Energy Information Administration estimates, has tapered off slightly at about 13.1, but we are still, Matt, by far the world's largest oil producer. Um, and of course, you and I have talked plenty about refineries. This is the time of year that oil prices Prices, you know, they may stay steady, although they will say that <clears throat> last week um, oil prices did hit their highest level since October. And that's where oil markets are back today. We are still above the $80 barrel mark. We're down about 25 cents right now to $82. But it becomes all about refineries, uh, refineries, refineries, refineries. And, you know, mentioning that as we sit here, um, Los Angeles has become the first city to uh, hit the $5 gallon mark. It's been a few months. Uh, they did hit it last October. The California uh, average mat also within arm's reach of $5 a gallon. If you're on the West Coast, we just mentioned the biggest increases, right, have been on the West Coast. That's expected to continue. Um, I expect that California will, again, hit the $5 a gallon mark. So, uh, you know, if you're listening, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Alaska, Hawaii, you probably should uh, fill up sooner rather than later because I think there will be an upward trend. But Circling back, Matt, to your point, uh, yeah, absolutely. The U.S. remains the world's largest oil producer. And with OPEC and Russia uh, cutting production, it's, it's, not even, it's not even close. I mean, those countries are both producing less than 9 million barrels a day now, and the U.S. is producing over 13. So, so I'm going to ask the consumer question, why then, if we are able to produce so much oil, does OPEC making any statement uh, in any direction impact the, the price of oil so dramatically? Well, you know, a lot of that is because instead of just one country like Saudi Arabia and Russia, um, OPEC's crude oil production in February was about 29 million barrels a day. So if you add up all these countries that produce a lot of oil, Matt, 29 million barrels a day, that's quite a bit more than the U.S. at 13 million barrels, right? So the problem, Matt, is that that OPEC controls collectively, uh, you know, about a third uh, of the world's oil production. And that's where strength in numbers comes from, is that OPEC policy still is going to dictate prices because when you when you can control a third of the world's oil production you can you can really you know get the market going one way or another depending on what your policies depending on what you're talking about um, so that's why OPEC still is having a role on prices today but part of the reason why OPEC's having to make those decisions to cut production Matt is because the rise in US oil production and that uh would seemingly work uh, geopolitically in the favor of the United States. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Matt. If we were here and, and, and say, say it was, you know, say we're back in the early 2000s when the U.S. was only producing 5 million barrels a day, things would, be, uh, things would be a lot worse right now. And they would have gotten a lot worse last year, or I should say 2022 when Russia invaded Ukraine. Oh, it would be awful. You know, OPEC would, uh, you know, oil prices could be double what they are today. So, yeah, I mean, without the U.S. increasing its oil production um, over the last, you know, decade and a half, um, we'd be in a world of hurt right now. You've actually triggered a, a, a kind of a follow up question in one of your comments. Do you think that the geopolitical issues that are going on across the globe is what perhaps prompted uh, the oil companies uh, to produce more oil in, here in the U.S. as kind of a, 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 a like a safety uh, gap, mm -hmm. you know, type of a thing or a safety barrier type of a thing. Well, I, I think oil companies are always going to respond to economics, right? It's like if Apple is selling an iPhone, or if, if the market is there for for Apple to sell iPhones at a high rate, uh, a high rate, um, you know, they're going to produce more. So, you know, if, if you're making more in your stocks, what are you going to do? You're going to you're going to put more money in the market. And if oil companies are getting paid, you know, handsomely for a barrel of oil because it's in demand, well, they're going to produce more. So really, oil companies are responding, uh, responding to economics. If it's favorable to drill, they'll drill. If it's not, they won't. Just like during COVID, you'll remember that oil prices went negative. Um, remember that U.S. oil producers cut way, 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 way back. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of this delicate balancing act, Matt, of is oil high enough for them to justify producing it? Or if it's too low, they, they, will, they will decrease the amount of oil they're producing. 
And then one of the final questions I've got for this episode, um, there have been a lot of announcements with regard to, uh, you know, electric vehicles and possibly uh, moving the date back uh, just a little bit yeah. with regard to that. And I noticed uh, some even some comments about hybrid vehicles now. Um, maybe kind of give your thoughts on some of that, how that could impact oil production as we go over the next decade or so. What are kind of your thoughts in all of the, in all of this area? You and I have had the conversation in some areas of this country, uh, electric vehicles are literally right. not an option, uh, no matter how much you, uh, pound the podium, so to speak. It's, it's, it's just not a, it's not a physical reality of given the, <laughs> the geography of, of where you may happen to live. Well, I mean, there's a lot of infrastructure, speaking of infrastructure and, and bridges, look, look look at the age of some of the roads and bridges and, and infrastructure and and look at some of the age of the infrastructure that carries electricity, Matt, right? There, there's a lot of commonality there that they were built decades and decades and decades ago. The transmission in the United States is, is not getting any younger, the transmission system. So you know, our roads are decrepit and, and we're going to need a lot of improvements on EV before they become a long-term viable solution. So, and, and a lot of this, by the way, you know, it depends who's in the White House, depends on their flavor of the week, depending on if they're, you know, pro EV, or if they're anti EV. I mean, I think right now the two nominations, the new nominees, uh, the two nominees for both political party, one is very pro EV and one is anti EV. So I think now more than ever, EVs have become, you know, a, a very political uh, Hockey uh, subject. Puck. You know, exactly <laughs> moving back and forth and we don't know which goal it's going to fall in. You know, uh, uh, it's 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 it it's, is it's what kind it of is. a game, too, in that nature. It is. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's the key. And that kind of I mean, that's a that's a huge economic driver, no matter which way you move. And you're absolutely right with regard to the uh, infrastructure that we have. I mean, I'm currently paying where I, I live 17.4 uh, cents per kilowatt hour. The thought of transferring um, my fuel being electric into my vehicle is uh, uh, quite disturbing because, you know, when you factor it out, that 17.4 cents is a whole lot more expensive than the $3 and, you know, 39 or 29 cents per gallon that I'm paying uh, at the pump. So that becomes an area of concern as well. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big, it's a big issue, but um, you know, to say that EVs are mainstay and that there's infrastructure uh, all over us, that's perfectly adequate. I, I think, you know, <laughs> it's obviously a, a, a bit of fodder. So, you know, look for, look for more on that. Um, but uh, you know, no doubt the number of EVs does continue to go up. I think, you know, we've had this subject uh, come up before. I think, I think I'd be looking more towards uh, one of the Americans that is thinking more of a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, you know, because I, I like the dependence that I can have on, on finding a beautiful C store on my route, right? Whether it's one of those great new huge C stores or whatever it is, I can, I can hit the road and have no worry that there's going to be a gas station to fill up. But around town, you know, I'd, I'd like, you know, I'd like to uh, be able to plug it at home because I don't know about you, but you know, a lot of my trips in Chicago when I am there are local, uh, my mm -hmm. car has sat down here in Tampa. You know, it's been sitting since yesterday. We did take a little bit of a drive, but you know, there's there's a, a dynamic, a different dynamic for everything. And probably like you, right? Some days you'll you'll run on electricity, and you'll only need to run a couple places. And other days you'll you'll really be reliant on on uh, internal combustion. And that's that's the thing here, by the way. I'm in a, a, a you know furnished apartment. There's there's nowhere I could charge here at home. So right. that's a little bit of a difficulty with if I got an electric vehicle you know, I'd, I'd constantly be having to make special trips or longer trips to make sure, you know, if I go to a supercharger, uh, you know, to charge it up or something, that's a lot of time uh, invested. You know, it's a, it's it a lot of a headache. Basically, Patrick, what we've got is for the next four years, depending upon which side uh, of the geopolitical spe uh, 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 spectrum, if you will, gets into the office, that's, that's the direction that we're going to move yeah. in for the next four years. And understandably, either uh, presumptive nominee only has four years. They're both term limited right. out. Um, but nevertheless, a lot can be done with a direction in four years because there will come a point where, you know, like, let's say electric vehicles are the, the way to go. I mean, four additional years toward that overall goal, you will eventually reach that part of the pendulum where, there is no pulling back from that. You're just going to have to see it out, so to speak. So, I mean, yeah. there's a lot there uh, to really kind of keep a, a watchful November, eye on. November, November, yeah. right? 
you know, and 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 I think when when President Biden took the oath, uh, oath of office um, back in 2021, you know, all the the, the presidential orders that were signed uh, almost immediately, right on on the Keystone, on drilling, on, on a lot of different things. If the pendulum swings the other way, um, I would look for President Trump at the time. Then, you know, being the nominee, if he's elected, um, you know, within hours of of taking the oath oath of office, that he would probably swing the pendulum right back the other way. So. Um, I have no idea who's going to be elected. That's going to be really interesting. All I know is that the policies uh, that are on the books now could drastically swing the other way. And keep in mind, I think automakers, a lot of them, Matt, you, you know, uh, we, we've heard a lot of EV companies already, you know, slowing down plans. Fisker, um, which is an uh, EV producer, actually declared bankruptcy here yesterday. So th- there's been a, you know, and this is the danger that politicians pick and choose winners and losers. Right is Americans apparently an EV automaker, right has a great opportunity to grow right now. Look at Tesla, but then Fisker goes broke. So, you know, it it just highlights let Americans decide for themselves. I don't care if people want an EV; that's that's their call. I just it, it really, you know, politicians um, they can't just let Americans decide now. They apparently have to take options off the table or. Politicians have to force Americans to do something. That's a dangerous precedent, whether it's stopping the sales of EVs, which is ridiculous, or making people buy EVs. It's ridiculous. Both infringe on our freedom. So, and you know, creates it's going to be really interesting. Situation. You know, it Absolutely. creates an extreme situation because, for example, you know, what would I do video production wise? You know how many states I'm in on a weekly basis. How am I supposed to keep a battery charged to keep driving that kind of you know, distance. That's, that's crazy. So, I mean, it, it yeah. does create you, sh- you should have the choice to do what's best for you. And you're going to make that decision way, way, way better than anyone telling you what to do, right? No, the government doesn't know what you're going to need to do and what your capabilities are. So I, I, I think that's why it's, a, you know, politicians meddling into our lives. Um, you know, they can steer us, but I, I don't want, um, you know, I, and, and here we go down the political spectrum. That's just my take is, is I think Americans, can decide for themselves. Let them decide if they want an EV, that's fine. If they want an internal combustion engine vehicle, that's fine. But where this all wraps up again is that politics are going to have an inherent impact on policies um, early next year and, and when they vote this November, now more than ever before. And keep in mind, as, as we talk about gas prices, what is the one most visible thing to Americans that sets the bellwether for how many of them feel about the economy? It's like you. Seeing the price on the sign for gasoline has become such an economic barometer. Mm-hmm. It most definitely has. And my you know, drop. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, is exactly right. And um, that is one of those things, obviously, that uh, it is something to keep an eye on over the next several months and, and kind of come from there. I'm going to circle back really quickly again. Obviously, our thoughts and our prayers are with the folks uh, in, in the Baltimore area. Uh, and, you know, I... Uh, Today's uh, situation as of the time of the recording has been quite tragic, uh, and we, we certainly understand that. Um, this is not the first time, uh, believe it or not, that a freighter or a ship has collided in with a bridge. In fact, Patrick, where you are sitting right now, about 20 to 25 minutes away from you, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, uh, back in 1980, the original bridge, was also hit by a bridge in a 1,200 uh foot span, uh, if I my memory uh, serves correctly there. Well, hopefully fell, the bridge wasn't hit the by a bridge, but I think you mean uh, a ship. Was, was hit by hit a ship, a thank you, yes. A uh, 1,200-foot span then crumbled into, you know, into the bay, and, uh, and, and I believe off the top of my mind somewhere around 30 to 40 people unfortunately lost their lives. And- that's why my wife does not like driving across bridges. So, so one the the reason why I'm kind of bringing that up is number one. So this yeah. is this is not the only time that this has has actually happened, and it and it is always a horrible situation. But number two, my hope is even in the rebuilding there in Baltimore that they will actually take a page out of what of Tampa uh, did in in the state of Florida, and if memory serves me correctly. Uh, I'm going off the top of my mind, but I believe they're called dolphins and they're big round things that are filled with gravel oh, yeah. or concrete. And the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, the the new, the one that was rebuilt as a result of what took place, has something like 30 to 40 of these oh, large massive. round things. I'm looking things. at a picture now. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That and would that do a would lot pre- of damage to a ship. And actually, they are designed, if I remember correctly, to almost spin in circles for minor collisions so that it doesn't impact the the, the ship itself. 
Uh, they're they're quite remarkable in the way that they are designed, but understandably, they will do the job to prevent, uh, if futuristically speaking, anything that uh, you know has happened in the past in Tampa Bay and what unfortunately has happened uh, today in Baltimore. So I'm really surprised uh, that those have not been, you know, place put into place across areas of the country where. Uh, it, it makes sense to have them in a place like a, a bay or a, a large river setting there uh, in the Baltimore area. But nevertheless, we'll and, be, and to your point we'll there, Matt, that. yeah, they, they are structural dolphins um, yeah. that will deflect. And, and that's that's, you know, and, and not looking at it from a petroleum perspective, but looking at the bridge, it's just like I, I was thinking, you know, the Mackinac Bridge, uh, yep. they don't really have any of those either. And it's just like, you know, when you have these ultra large vessels um, that that have been built in recent decades, right? Ships are getting no smaller. I mean, look, right. look, look at some of the cruise lines as primary example, right? Icon of the Sea is the largest cruise ship ever built, and it's large. You know, <laughs> there, yeah, there's going to be there's going to be a need to protect the infrastructure there. And to your point, you know, looking at a view of the Tampa uh, Skyway, uh, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. To your point, there are so many of these large structural mm-hmm. dolphins that. Um, basically protect all of the critical supports of the bridge. So yeah, uh, yeah. What if if God forbid if what were what happened today in Baltimore were to happen uh, in, in the mouth of Tampa Bay there again, you would not have seen the type of situation. In theory, those dolphins should have stopped uh, before it ever made it to the bridge. Should have stopped the ship in its track. Um, so th- I will just simply say this: uh, regardless of which political side that you're on, this seems like a logical solution that perhaps Congress could really look at and the president, no matter who the president may be, to saying, you know, why don't we visit this, uh, take some examples like the Sunshine Skyway Bridge and the dolphins that surround its piers that are driven into the ground and install those across, as you just mentioned, the critical infrastructure to try to prevent something like this in the future. Uh, Will it be an expense? Yes, but it's a whole lot cheaper than trying to rebuild a bridge. And of course, the loss of life would not be there as well. It's something to really seriously consider and really give some 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 legitimate thought to as a bipartisan effort. Well, ho- hopefully some of the politicians are listening to the program. I mean, you, usually we uh, pine about uh, gas prices and politicians doing silly things like fragmenting the summer gasoline system. But I think, you know, we've, we've made some really, uh, really strong points here protecting the infrastructure that the, uh, that is out there, whether it's bridges or, you know, vital infrastructure, highways, pipelines. Uh, so on. There, there's a lot of things we could do out there. I think for now, as we wrap it up, though, um, again, thinking about the loss of life in Baltimore for consumers. I mean, uh, you know, by the way, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the national average has been holding at about 353, 354 for the last week or so. Um, I'm going to be a little bit optimistic and upbeat or try to be upbeat here at the the end of this is that I'm hopeful that we are getting closer to a temporary top. I don't know if it's going to be a permanent top because uh, hurricane season, Matt, later this summer, uh, is supposed to be fairly active by early models, but I don't know if there's a whole lot more gas in the tank when it comes to the increase in prices that we've been seeing and knock on wood that there's no refinery issues, but uh, we'll leave it there for now. Matt, now hopefully that sounds good to you that we're getting close to the end, at least for now. Oh, yeah. No, we'll, uh, of course, uh, keep you up to date on everything. And we thank you so much for joining us here on Over a Barrel. And you just have yourself uh, uh, a good week.